Okay. So we are recording. All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much for for showing up this morning in Hawaii time. And um, for those of you also who are going to be listening to this at another time, um, we welcome you as well. I want to um, just start off with kind of a, just a moment to kind of land. Um, just a little pause before we get started. So if it's comfortable for you, you can just let your eyes close. If you would prefer to keep your eyes open, just kind of keeping a soft gaze downward. And just doing a little check in right now. Just feeling your body. Feeling your seat on whatever you're sitting on. Your feet are on the ground, just feeling that contact with the ground. I just want to take a moment to acknowledge there's a lot of deep suffering going on in the world right now. Just giving a moment to just name that and be present with that. Just begin to feel the breath as it moves in and out of your body. Just connecting with this life giving sacred breath that most of us take for granted so often. And as we breathe in, just receiving this gift that has come to us from the plant, the ocean life that generates the oxygen that we breathe. Just bringing that into the body, becoming a part of you. And as you exhale, returning the gift, the carbon dioxide that your body no longer needs can be taken up by the plants to give them life. And then just taking a moment of gratitude for this body, for the place where you are in this moment, the support of the earth that gives us everything we need And then taking a moment to connect with your intention for being here today or for being listening to this recording. Perhaps it's just curiosity. Perhaps you want to learn a little more. Perhaps you're already committed to doing a global earth exchange. Just bringing that into your awareness, your intentions for being here. And inviting in a sense of curiosity and presence during the time we meet together, whether it's right now in live meeting or at the, during the recording later. And then when you are ready, just start to open your eyes if they're closed. And again, just thank you all for being here today. We're going to start this morning by myself and Jennifer, who is um, so graciously offered to help me this morning because our, um, our dear friend Chris is not able to um, be here this morning, or he may show up um, if he is able. Um, so I want to do a little bit of introduction of myself, and Jennifer can introduce herself. And then we're going to go over just a brief um, outline of what we're going to do today. And then we will 
get started. So I want to just um, share a little bit about myself, just so you have a little bit of an understanding of why I'm here today. Um, I actually immigrated to the Hawaiian Islands when I was a child. I, I actually didn't want to come here. I wanted to stay where I was, but now I'm immensely grateful that I um, that I was that I came here. Um, I call the town of Kaava on the island of Oahu my home. It's where my heart is, but I'm currently residing in Honolulu. I would also like to just take a moment to acknowledge that this place where I am is, um, it's an illegally occupied state. And I just want to recognize that these islands, the surrounding ocean and the Hawaiian people are partly who shaped me to who I am today. And I'd really like to honor the ancestors of this place, both the human and the non-human and also how their way of being shaped this place into what it is today and that allow me to, to receive the gifts of this place. Um, there's been so much generosity and aloha that I have received from so many Hawaiians in my community. I also feel a real sense of duty to protect this place. I have spent my over 25 year career in the field of conservation in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, Hawaii is known as the endangered species capital of the world, which unfortunately we have su su suffered immense loss. Um, but I have had the great privilege to steward these places and animals and plants. Um, my um, experiences in my career took me to a place called Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument, which is a chain of islands northwest of the more commonly known inhabited islands of Oahu. And from, I would say, from Kauai or Niihau to Hawaii Island, um, where most of the people live. Um, through that time, I stayed out on islands for about three months at a time with just maybe two to three other people and did this multiple times. And some of those times we didn't even have any way to contact the outside world other than this really basic texting. Um, and through that experience of being completely isolated from other humans, um, being in these islands that are some of the re most remote islands in the world was an extremely life-changing experience for me. Um, it was a place of great healing. I was going through personal grief and um, the place was just a, a real support for me to be so interconnected with, with the whole greater nature. Um, it was also a place that was just incredibly pristine in some ways, but completely impacted by destructive human habits in others. The, there was debris all over the beaches most remote beaches in the world um, covered with cigarette lighters and light sticks and plastics and televisions and just everything under the sun, basically. Um, so it was a real, um, a real contrast of being in this place of great beauty and um, in some ways completely untouched by humans and yet the impacts of our, of our you know, the things that we do to this, this earth. And through that experience, um, I eventually pursued a master's degree in eco-psychology, which is about, to me, a more holistic approach to conservation work and bringing more love for the world and um, remembering our interconnectedness, how we are part of this beautiful planet that we live on. And while I was doing my master's program, I was at Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado, is where I first was exposed to Radical Joy for Hard Times and the Global Earth Exchange. Um, I didn't feel, I'll go into it a little bit more, but I, I, my initial thoughts were I didn't, you know, I didn't have a connection to that place. So I didn't really, I was just very curious what it was gonna be. And it turned out to be a very powerful experience. Um, I think that is basically all I'm gonna say for now. And I will share some of that a little later in how, how that experience uh, affected me and, and how it you know became part of my practice to do these global earth exchanges. And then I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Jennifer. So Jennifer can introduce yourself. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jennifer Fendia. I'm a psychologist and a forest therapy guide in Buffalo, New York. And um, I was born in the Great Lakes and I've spent most of my life, as it turns out, um, some intentionally, some unintentionally, 
on the Great Lakes. Um, and um, I guess when when you grow up here, uh, it's hard to not come back. Um, when I was growing up, the Great Lakes were um, not in not in great shape. I grew up on Lake Erie. I still live on Lake Erie now, and um, and uh, the water was very polluted, and the rivers were very polluted from all the industry. And I grew up always knowing that the the earth was um, really struggling with what we were doing to it. Um, uh, I remember Love Canal. I remember Three Mile Island. Uh, my dad worked in a factory. I remember when they said it wasn't safe to swim in Lake Erie, but we did anyway. Um, and I guess it's not as bad now. Um, we understand a little bit more now about uh, what we take for granted, the carrying capacity of, of our planet. And, um, but as, as I think we all know, we, we pretty much take what we want. And as Liz just said, we toss what we don't want back and um so my work has been mostly with individuals in in my private practice but outside of that I've always been involved in some kind of work with nature and so when I found radical joy I was <laughs> radically joyful um I just think it's a beautiful practice and um my gatherings have been small, just myself and a couple of other people. And um, it's been lovely. And I'm hoping this year that we'll have a little bit of a larger gathering in a very urban place. Um, it's not hard to look around and see a place that needs lots of love. So that is all I will say. And welcome to everyone. Thank you, Jennifer. So we'll just I'll just go over a, a little brief background of Radical Joy for Hard Times and the Global Earth Exchange. We'll go over the five steps, which is, you know, the really heart, heart and soul of this work. And then just some other considerations. Um, we were going to maybe do some breakout rooms, but I think we have such a small group. We can probably just share, you know, if there's time at the end for questions and other people want to share. Um, I want to just really invite this, you know, there's, I'm sure I know there's people in here who have participated in the Global Earth Exchange besides Jennifer and myself. So I know there's a lot of wisdom that you all have just, you know, just probably the fact that you're here. Um, we want to invite you to, um, to share throughout, um, you know, make this a little bit more conversational. Um, we can pause for questions. Um, I just do ask that we make sure to share the space, be mindful. Um, you know, being lean with your words to give others a chance if, if others want to speak. And that is it. And we'll go ahead and jump in right now. So for those of you who aren't familiar, um, Radical Joy for Hard Times is a nonprofit organization founded by Trevi Johnson. We're a global community. Um, Trevi is also the executive director. I, am, I forgot to mention that I'm a board member of, of Radical Joy for Hard Times. Um, this Organization is a global community of people who give attention to places that are most ignored or dismissed, these wounded places. Our mission is to deeply connect with natural places that have been damaged through human or natural acts. And spending time in wounded places, we expose our hearts to difficult feelings of loss and guilt, listen to the land and to one another, and open ourselves to the possibilities of finding and creating beauty in these places. Um, the Global Earth Exchange is something that has been being held since 2010. So it kind of came about, I think it was a few months maybe after the organization was founded. They, um, the, the founder and the original board decided to hold an event um, that was called this Global Earth Exchange. And it was so well attended all over the world, it actually became an annual event. And we are um, entering into our 15th this year. It'll be on June 15th. For our 15th anniversary and we certainly hope you will join us 
Um, since it started, it's been held on all seven continents and all over the globe. It's a very universal practice. Um, you can adapt it to whatever culture or place that you're at. It's a, to me, it's a very simple yet very powerful act. Um, not everyone understands why we would do this. Um, there are many people who just, you know, don't want to go there. They don't want to go to a wounded place. They don't understand. Um, but most people who do participate, I think, from my experience and others, find that we do this practice, we come into a new relationship with the world. And it doesn't have to be just something that we do on a annual basis. I think really importantly, I want to honor one of my teachers, Joanna Macy. Um, she talks about honoring our pain for the world and how it is a reflection of our love for the places. Just like our, our grief and pain for loss of people is just a reflection of how much immense we, how much immensity we love them. This is just an opportunity for us to bear witness and be with places that are suffering, just like we would want to be with our loved other loved ones who are suffering. There's a multitude of reasons for doing this practice. Um, uh, some of them I've already named. A place that you love is wounded, perhaps a place you avoid because it's really hard and it hurts to be around. Um, there's a lot of change occurring that is, you know, this is a way to recognize some of that change, you know, like climate change, for example, seeing some of the changes in your own community just from, from the um, impacts of climate change. Perhaps a place is actually calling to you or your community may need to connect with a place and it's a it's an opportunity for you to come together as a community to connect to a place there may be other there certainly are others if anyone has any any things you want to add to that feel free to place it in the chat or unmute yourself we'll just pause for a minute So one of the first things before we host a global earth exchange is finding a place or choosing a place. Um, one of the one of my most um, revered, I suppose, quotes is from Wendell Berry. He talks about there are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. So finding a site to host a global earth exchange is finding out those desecrated places in your community. Um, there are a multitude of ways that you can find a site. Um, I have found, um, and others who've done them, please, please feel free to chime in after I speak. But I have found, um, I kind of just sit with it. I, and it kind of depends if I am choosing to do it with a group of people, you might invite people to come up with a place along with you. Um, it's um, just something that I personally, I, I don't usually, I, I kind of just sit with it for a while. It's almost like I'm tuning in to where a place would like to be, um, to be recognized. Um, there might be a place really close by in your neighborhood, it might be a place somewhere further away and anywhere in between. Anyone else want to offer some some uh, ideas of how you choose a place? Jennifer? Yeah, um, maybe this was kind of unusual, but mm -hmm. two years ago, I was traveling through where my brother and sister-in-law and my sister-in-law's mom live together. And um, we're Ukrainian, Ukrainian American. And um, we did our practice for all of the losses of people and animals and the beautiful land in Ukraine, just in their backyard. Um, they happen to live on a small river in eastern New York State. And we just each walked around the property and we used our imagination to be with the people in Ukraine. Um, we've seen enough photos of the destruction there. 
And we just offer to the river all of our thoughts and our wishes um, for the land and, and the people and the, and the waterways there. And it was a simple and it was silent and that was it. So I just wanted to share that because sometimes um, your place may be um, not obvious, might not be right in front of you. You can still do that for a place that's not right there. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Jennifer. Um, I will also add, um, there is the Global Earth Exchange is a uh, very adaptable. It's um, it's you're you're welcome to make it what works for you in your community. There, you know, like this is a global community, so some cultures may have a different way of, of being. Um, so you really can just take these five steps that we're going to talk about and just adapt them in any way that works for you. Um, and just talking about selecting a place, there, there's such a vast array of things you can do. And Jennifer spoke of that a little bit. It doesn't really have to just be a place. It could, you know, there was a person who did a global earth exchange for pollution in the air. Um, you, you know, you could go to a prison, a place where there's wounded people, hospital. Um, I can share a little bit later, um, but uh, I have done my backyard, a forest in my neighborhood, uh, while I was traveling somewhere, um, just a multitude of places. There's no, it's limitless that, you know, that you can do this in any way. And I actually, um, one of my biggest pains for the world is the loss of the night sky. Um, having been in such remote places, I um, really feel immense grief when I look at the night sky in Honolulu and how much we are not seeing. Um, and I'm actually considering doing a global earth exchange this year for the sky, the night sky. Um, so it's very, uh, you know, anything and everything that, that, that you can think of. There's no real um, bounds. It's, it's, it's limitless how you can do this. Um, and then I think anyone else want to add anything? Um, I, I wanted to add just something to this because <clears throat> I have a group here on Big Island that I think is going to come together and, and do this together. And a, uh, I think my friend couldn't make it today, but she did want to want me to bring this forward to the group. Um, just to be, I guess, like cultural sensitivity of places. So yeah. some places are off limits because they're, um, there's specific like say Ho'okupu that are supposed to go there, you know, or making sure, I don't know, like somehow also being mindful of wherever we are in the world, the host culture. Correct. Like, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, if you want to um, add, you know, thank you for sharing that and naming that. It's very important. And I, I actually am going to be talking about that. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I just wanted you to know that that is part of it. So you're welcome to continue or or add to it when I speak of that. Or just in saying that it's not limitless. Like, I think that there is a limit there. That's true that you're, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. I just meant limitless that you can be creative in the ways that you choose to do it, but you're absolutely right. There, there are some considerations that, that are very important to, to keep in mind. So thank you so much for naming that. Um, and so we'll just go into the five steps. Um, the first step is just going to a wounded place. And this is something um, that I really want to encourage you to actually be physically present. And so this kind of speaks a little bit of to what Leela just named that perhaps it, if, if you really want to do a global earth exchange for a place that maybe isn't really the right place to go, we don't want to stop you, but I really encourage you to choose a place where you can be physically present. And if, if it's not a place where you should be physically present, you can still do a global earth exchange. But the real, real, um, real big difference, I think, of actually being in the place um, where you might need to face the things there that you would act rather avoid. Um, you know, there's a tendency for many of us to want to look away to those wounded places. But I guess in that sense, um, if there is a place that really calls to you that you 
you don't feel safe for whatever reason or that it isn't appropriate, um, you know, we don't want to say you can't do it, but we encourage you to actually be physically present to a place. Um, when, when we're doing our global earth exchange and we're going to a wounded place, we're not there to heal or fix anything about the place, although that may happen. Um, I want this really beautiful quote from Oscar Wilde, where there is sorrow, there is holy ground. And I feel like that really just sums up being present in that place of um, feeling the holiness of the place, no matter how damaged or wounded it might be. So just some other other tips. Um, you know, it might not, as I mentioned earlier, it might take a while to figure out a place. Um, Can you I ask also, sure. Right. I, I just wanted something that came up to me in, in regards to physically being there. Like, so just something personal for me is like the military impact on Hawaii in Hawaii, I feel is a great wound, you know, across the islands. And um, like, say, 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 for example, there's a, a park that's radioactive, you know, on Saddle Road. Um, and of course, like Joanna's Macy's work going to like nuclear sites mm -hmm. to observe. Um, and then I started thinking, I'm like, wait, do I, like considering that level of pollution and physically being there, like, you know, would you recommend like, is, is that an instance where you would do it remotely from another site, but project in or like, you know, where there's mines or these kind of all over the world too, right? These, these kind of like millet, the, the impact of, um, of, of, and, and access, right. Cause they're blocked, but you don't, or they're behind gates or, um, it's like somehow picking a site that's maybe within distance, but like, I like how you, Julia, you said using your imagination to go there, go inside. But would you say like, watch out for like the radioactive stuff or? Yeah, I, that is also something we'll talk about a little bit of just some safety considerations, but yeah, we, I definitely encourage you to, to go to a place where there are not physical dangers to you or yourself or the people you're bringing with you. Um, I think, you know, if I, you know, you actually participated in a global earth exchange with me where we went to a place where it was a military recreational area, but there was also an off limits area. And we actually, I'll show a photo to everyone of, we, we created our bird. I don't know if that, I think you were there that time where we created the bird on the, on the actual fence of the um, barbed wire fencing. So, you know, I think you can do it from a, a, a little bit of a distance to keep your safety. Um, and again, it is, you know, there are no real rules. It, you know, this is something that you create this, you know, use your own creative, creative expression of how you want to honor the place. Um, and, you know, where you are, who you are, you know, there, there may be people here who are, you know, very different communities than ours in Hawaii. Um, so it's very, very accessible to everyone in whatever way your culture, your place works, and you can just adapt it to how it feels right to you and the people participating with you. So thank you for asking about that. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah. Ocean, you know, being by the ocean, ocean pollution, all kinds of things. Um, does anyone have ideas that you're thinking of that you want to share just, just kind of Places. Like I mentioned, I'm thinking about doing mine for the night sky. Um, I'm not 100% sure that's what I'm going to do, but that's kind of what's calling to me right now. Okay, we'll just move along. So step two. So step one being going to the place. Step two is sitting a while and sharing your stories. So, the, you know, this, if you're doing it by yourself, you're, you know, maybe you just journal your stories. Um, I also recommend, as if, as you're being a facilitator of this, to kind of um, do a short grounding practice before you begin. Um, and again, I'll talk a little bit more about some kind of cultural considerations and things like that. Um, but just having a short grounding practice, arriving, um, if it feels right to you, you may want to introduce yourself to the place. Um, 
for to perhaps even asking permission of the place before you go. Um, so sometimes you're going to go to a place that you have been that you feel very wounded about um, and you have some memories of the place in a different way. Um, as you come together, if you're in a group, you can share your stories of the place as you knew it then and maybe how you've seen it change, you know, memories that you have, feelings of what happened when it was wounded, how that felt to you. Um, I think it's really just a way of reminding ourselves what our relationship is with that place. If you are alone, as I mentioned, maybe you can just journal your memories, journal your feelings, otherwise just sharing with, with the people you're with. Any questions on that? Other, other examples people might have? We'll go on to step three. So step three is getting to know the place as it is now. And this is, um, you know, when I've done this, I usually, if I'm doing it with a group, I will have everyone go off for maybe half an hour or so and just spend time on the land. And it's a real beautiful practice of deep listening, noticing what you see, being really present, perhaps engaging with the place. And by actually spending time with the place, you can see what is there, what's growing, what isn't growing. You see the wounds of the place. You might even discover the place is really resilient and there's a lot of life around you that you possibly weren't even aware of. Um, possibly even some insights into the people who damaged the place, assuming it was human. Sometimes we go to a da damaged place that's damaged by nature, greater nature. So just being with the place as it is now, as it is that day that you're there. And as you're in this place, I some things that I invite is a willingness to not know. So kind of just getting out of your head. Like I, you know, being in the field of conservation, I might go to a place and I'm like, oh, these are all invasive species and I'm like seeing all these invasive species, but just getting out of the head, checking into the heart and the body. That's how we really engage with the world, with our senses, using our senses, listening to the sounds of the place. There may be a, a multitude of sounds that are pleasant and some that are not pleasant. Um, listening to the land, you know, maybe it isn't speaking to you in English or whatever your language is, but there may be some conversation going on and we take the time to pay attention. We're just showing up and really feeling like in this time that we're living in that deep listening is a gift that the world really needs right now. And that goes with listening to ourselves, listening to each other and the places where we reside, where we visit. Anyone have anything else to add to that? How you have been in a place, getting to know it. And in that experience, you might find a lot of pain, maybe some joy, delight, beauty. And that's where we come back, if we're doing this with a group, into step four, where we're going to share what it is that we discovered. There's a beautiful quote from poet Mary Oliver. She says, instructions for living a life. Pay attention. Be astonished and tell about it. So coming back together, if you're doing this with a group, coming back together and just sharing the stories of what came up for you while you were there being with that place. To me, this is a really, really powerful medicine. I don't know if those of others of you who have, who have experienced the Global Earth Exchange, just that sharing really brings a connection to me not just to um, the people who are sharing, but also to the place. You know, it's opening my eyes a little more to the place, maybe something I hadn't noticed. Or sometimes when I hear people sharing, 
I noticed, oh, I actually noticed that too, but I didn't notice, I noticed. So that's to me the beauty of that when we come in together as a community and sharing what we experience. And also important as a facilitator to really honor the experiences of everyone, no matter what it is that they share. You know, you may as a facilitator come in with this preconceived idea of what the experience is supposed to be like for people. You want it to be a positive experience. It may not be for everyone. So just being willing as a facilitator to be with that and to honor that as well. You know, not everyone has the same experiences. Um, so that's just something that I feel is, you know, really bringing that, not only are we honoring the place for what it is in our practice, but also the people who come and show up or the other beings that show up. And then we get to step five. And step five is when we make a gift of beauty for the place. This is the joy in the radical joy for hard times. And this gives us an opportunity to give back something to the place. This is a place that has given so much to others, human and non-human. And it can be anything. It can be any kind of art piece. Um, one of the more common uh, offerings that we create a, a piece of beauty is the model of the radical joy bird. Um, and I'll show, I'll show a, a photo of that. Birds are universal. They're everywhere, most places, I should say. And then they transcend all kinds of difficulties. They're often a sign of hope, an ability to carry on. Um, when I have done these Global Earth Exchanges, we usually use materials from the place. Um, some people do bring art or other pieces, uh, objects that they want to create with the art with. Um, I really want to also just um, remind everyone that doesn't have to, you know, this is an opportunity to, sh to express your creative human nature. So you can, I'll show some, some slides um, in a few minutes of just some ideas of, you know, showing what other people have done. Um, so when I've done it, we've used materials from anywhere from like flowers, rubbish, um, and a mixture, you know, stone, sticks, those kinds of things. I want to just honor, also recognize, um, be aware that in some places it's not appropriate to move or things or pick flowers, those kinds of things. So maybe like something like moving stones is not appropriate in certain places. Um, so you just want to kind of, um, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but just, you know, you want to really sort of be aware of what your places you're choosing. Um, any kind of art. Um, you can also offer prayers. I really love to read poetry during the Global Earth Exchange. You can ask everyone to offer gestures. I often have like people be in a circle and then turn outwards and then offer whatever gesture they want. So that kind of removes if people feel self-conscious, you know, they can just do whatever they want, no one's looking. Um, offer dance, but po possibly tending to the place. So many ways, it's just an invitation to be, express your, your creativity of being alive. Very spontaneous. I, I really re recommend having it be spontaneous and not like planning out ahead what you're gonna create, just letting the place create with you. Um, you know, when we when we do these um, creating a piece of beauty in this wounded place, people comment that often they feel like, you know, this place was, you know, they see it, thought it was like this really ugly wounded place. And now they're actually seeing it as this very resilient, beautiful place. So I, I uh, invite you to be open to that experience. Um, according to Trevi, the steps number one, and number five are the most important. So actually going to the place, as I spoke of, and um, I don't want to you know, limit anyone, but going to the place is really, really powerful. And then also making that offering of beauty in art in whatever form you like. Oh, can I ask something about that? This kind of also came up in um, my group. Uh, so sometime, or I'm trying to remember if we did this, but is it part of the practice to then dismantle the art piece and return it to somewhat how it was before? Or do you leave whatever you've created there? Or I think, it, don't you do it and then take the picture and then dismantle? Or I think that's totally up to you. 
um, you know, if, if depending where you are and how appropriate it feels. Um, I think we have not dismantled ours when we've done it. I, I have not dismantled mine. Oh. At least maybe maybe we have. I don't remember. I've done so many of these. If you remember us dismantling it, maybe we did. Or somehow the the because I feel like there's a creation of the piece, and sometimes the dis, the like a intentional dismantling. Yeah. Is also like in the practice. To, Absolutely. I mean, you don't want to like return the place if it, like it's not like you're returning the wound. You know what I mean? Right. But right. returning. I don't know. I Just think being, you're acknowledging the impermanence when you yeah. you dismantle the place. I mean the offering, not the place. <laughs> you dismantle the <laughs> if you dismantle the, the 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 offering of the beauty, I think you're acknowledging that everything is impermanent, which is the nature of the universe. And um it, I think it's really up to you, you know, where you are, who you're with. Yeah. Good question. Very good question. Um I'll just touch on the you know why the radical joy bird as a um, as a model for your art. So in the I think it was in the first board meeting, um, which was in two thousand nine, I believe they were um, the members were trying to come up with a shared vision, and then they had put out all this paper and started drawing and writing on it and stuff, and it just looked kind of random, I guess. But when they finished it, they carried it outside, and it just kind of looked like random scribble and whatever but they actually somebody noticed they sort of stood up on a table i think and kind of having that bird's eye view they actually noticed it was a shape of a bird and so they instantly saw that it was this crazy bird facing all of the dark stuff of the wounded places and striding into it singing so that's kind of the mm -hmm. um the story behind the the emblem of radical joy for hard times so every time people make a radical joy bird or other piece of art for a damaged place. They're bringing in the spirit of joy, boldness, and, transcend and transcendence, both to the place as well as themselves. So that is the five steps, and I can just name them once again, just for everyone. And there is, I will share a link there. Um, there's a lot of information on our websites on how to, you know, with these five steps and how to do this practice. Um, one is going to the wounded place, the second step is sitting a while and sharing your stories of the place as you as you knew it and how you are experiencing it now. Um, the step three is getting to the place as it is now, going out onto the land or the wherever it is that you are, sharing what you discover in the stories that you share together. And then step five is making a gift of beauty for the place. So that is the five steps. Does anyone have any questions? Everyone all good? Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, for step number four, no, sorry. Sitting a while and sharing, like what is the time range you think for that? You know, that is also something I like at least 20 minutes to half an hour, but you know, we're, we're living a really busy world. And if you feel like you only have a window of, you know, so much time to do your global earth exchange, um, you might want to do it shorter. I, I, you know, to me, like at least 20 minutes or half an hour gives you time to really spend a little time. Um, and when you're doing it with yourself or just friends, you could, you could all just, you know, take your time and do it as long as you want. So it's a really cool. good question too. And I think that's just something I think all of this is for me a practice of really going into that deep listening like what what is feeling like getting out of the head and going into what what is what is feeling what feels right in that place and with the people you're with um that that's something that's really important to me is like to not have too much planned out ahead of time and just listen to the place and the people who show up and adapt from there that's just the way I, I work um, and not getting too rehearsed and scripted um, because then it, you know, just becomes a little bit more in the head and we're trying to get into the heart and have that heart connection with place. Other questions? 
I'm gonna um, try to try to share my screen really quick and show you the radical joy bird. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen now. You guys seeing something? Okay, thank you. Thanks for the thumbs up. <laughs> um, so I'll put it in slideshow view. So that is the emblem. And you'll see, I'll show, share some slides with you of, of, the, of the different varieties, <laughs> the different artistic expressions of this bird, um, as well as some non-bird um, non offerings that people have given oh there's a there's something that says a free keynote update could you just hit no thanks because Thank just you. Uh, i don't see it hang on or there's like a no thanks go to apps yeah it it's just in front of on from Thank my you. oh here we go oh okay, wait i'll i'll go i'll i don't see that that's weird i'll i'll um try to fix that when we i'll go back in there okay thank you <laughs> I can't see that. That's weird. Um, okay, so I just want to touch a little bit about um, some other considerations, some of which Leela already mentioned. Um, one of those is physical safety. So we touched on this a bit, but I really recommend avoiding toxic places, even just um, unstable ground, you know, if there's been a lot of rain, you know, just being aware of your surroundings, being aware of your place, being aware of weather, you know, there can be flash floods, lightning storms, extreme temperatures, other environmental dangers. I highly discourage trespassing. Um, those are just some other, other safety considerations people can think of. I guess there's also like, um, just environment, I think maybe I mentioned that, but just environmental dangers, you know, where there, if it's a, if it's a place where there's a lot of litter, um, an empty lot or something, you might, you know, there could be broken glass, those kinds of things. So making sure people are dressing appropriately. Um, I recommend especially bringing, having, you know, when you send out your information, making sure to make out a list of things maybe to bring, like water, if there's no water nearby, that kind of thing. Maybe like gloves in a garbage bag or yeah. I remember we used to do like, like if you're going to do garbage pickup, have people have gloves. Yeah. That's another one people might tend. So the, the, the idea isn't to go and like do a beach cleanup, but people do clean up the beach while they're there because we, you know, we just are compelled to pick it up. So yeah, bring, that's a great idea. If it's a place where there may be litter, people might want to pick up, just have it as an offering. There's no pressure for people to do it is what I would recommend. Um, you know, making sure everyone's dressing appropriately, keeping out, keep your eye out for the weather. If it looks rainy, maybe making, recommending rain jackets, those kinds of things. Um, another, other important considerations is leaving no trace. Sunscreen. Sunscreen. Yeah. Good one. Hats. Um, leaving no trace, which kind of speaks a little bit to what you asked about Leela of, you know, do we dismantle the, the, um, the, the offering. Um, but again, I think it just depends on where you are. Um, we want to really make sure we don't further harm the place, um, the plants, the animals, the ecosystems that's there, being really mindful of like, for example, trampling plants. So staying on trails if you're in an area. Um, you also want to be really mindful and respectful of the culture, the community, where you go. Like I had mentioned earlier, it may not be appropriate to move stones or other objects, uh, picking flowers and those kinds of things. So really, I can't, you know, because this is a global community, um, I can't speak to specifics, but, you know, you, you know, probably know better in your own local community, some of these things. Um, if you're not aware, I recommend doing research and I'll speak about a little bit again. Um, some also some psychological safety tips if you're going to be the facilitator. Um, I think it's really important to make it a safe space for people. Um, using invitational language, so not 
not forcing people to do things, but inviting them. Um, naming that all feelings are welcome. If you do have a group and you want to have that step where everyone shares their stories, I always leave the space for silence is just as welcome. We need more silence in the world. So if you don't want to share a story, you don't have to. I think that's really important. Practice self-compassion for yourself, you know, especially if you're the facilitator. Um, you know, this might be a new experience for you. So it's just looking at it as a learning opportunity. Um, maybe it's gonna, not going to be perfect. <laughs> um, also, some things you might share with your group if you have a group. That deep listening that I spoke to earlier, really just listening and being present with each person as they're speaking, not rehearsing what you're going to say or thinking of something else. Try It's a practice. We all, we all are um, probably guilty of that, but just being aware of it. So that might be something that you can name to be really deeply listening to the place, trying to get out of your thoughts. And if you notice you're, you're not listening, just coming back. It's a very mindful practice. And also, um, Something you might name, um, you know, there are some people that that don't want to speak or share, like keeping it safe for them. And then there's there are some people that maybe are much more outgoing and outspoken, and that's wonderful. Um, we we love to have that diversity of of types of people, but also just naming, you know, not maybe not taking being aware if you're that type of person to not take up too much space and leaving that space for other people, being lean of speech. Um, another thing as a facilitator, I think um, if someone is showing really strong emotions, um, you know, a lot of times we have a tendency to like want to comfort and, <clears throat> you know, put our arms around them and give them tissue. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I also feel like sometimes when we do that, it's coming from our own discomfort. And sometimes the message might be that it's not okay to 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 feel that and we want to stop it you know even though that's not maybe our intention you know i'll talk about this a little bit but we are in a very sort of a, a grief illiterate society in my opinion um so letting those tears flow that is actually an act of beauty and offering in itself <clears throat> um all tears are welcome all emotions are welcome And then again, as a facilitator, um, you know, taking care of yourself. Some of us being a facilitator, especially if it's your first time, it might be a little bit of a stretch. You might feel a little anxiety. And if that's the case for you, maybe just starting small, like just having a friend or two or family member or somebody, then you can kind of build those skills so that you can next time, next year or some other time, um, you can build on, build on it and, and create more and more space for people. You just don't want to get it. You don't want to get... I don't recommend doing it, you know, doing it for the first time and inviting 100 participants. If you've never done any kind of facilitating, you, know, you might kind of be so challenged that you could lose sight of your purpose. But you all know, you know, just getting to know your own level of comfort. <clears throat> Other considerations anyone ha can think of, just psych psychological safety, creating a safe space. I'm sure I've missed some. Okay. Maybe one thing just that I... Um learned recently like so if you're going to go out on if you're going to send people out to explore maybe giving a little boundary like oh maybe explore so that people don't get lost or wander really too far but very good one yeah you don't want to lose people and that's another thing also um if you do have a group especially i would set a time and make sure maybe that's something you put on your list of what to bring as a timepiece which most people have their phones now um, so yeah, having a timepiece and making sure that everyone's back at the same time. Another thing you could do, depending on the place, if it's a big enough place and it's harder to keep those boundaries, is just making sure everyone has a buddy where they don't have to, um, yeah. they don't have to like hang out the whole time with them, but just keep your line of sight on those, on that person. It's really depending on what the place, how big and how lost people can get. That's another really good one. Other, other thoughts? Elizabeth, what did you some... see the, the hand up? Yeah, I did not. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, what if someone is angry and they're like triggered and they're just venting or whatever? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think it's really going to depend on like how well you know the person. This might be another reason to, if you, um, if you're new to facilitating, sticking with people, you know, in a smaller group. Um, but I think being with somebody who's angry, if, if it's starting to feel unsafe for people, you know, you might want to do what you would do in a normal situation. If somebody's on the street starting to get really activated and starting to feel unsafe, maybe asking them kindly, gently that, that, that people are feeling uncomfortable and you'd like them to leave. And if they don't, <laughs> you know, hopefully this would never happen. But if they're just feeling anger and expressing it, that is welcome. We all probably feel some anger and, and validating that feeling. I think any of the feelings that come up, I think validating them and, and, and sharing. And you might even like if, if you if somebody's expressing how angry they are at people or a person or something, you could say, yeah, sometimes I feel that too. I understand that we, you know, I think most of us here can understand that. Because anger is a, you know, anger is a really intense emotion and it's really just information as are all our emotions, but something's not right. You know, it's, it's very welcome. Just keeping that safety zone. <laughs> so, yeah. And I think, you know, most people who will show up at a place like, you know, an invitation for something like this, you know, I, you know, I think it, you'll probably be okay. I've never heard of anyone having a, a situation where they felt psychological you know, people were unsafe physically or psychologically from another person but really important to welcome all those emotions and i'll talk talk about that again a little bit further down the line where we're getting close to that um so just a couple other considerations that leela also kind of brought up um so land acknowledgement um is something depending on where you are and who you are. You know, you may be indigenous to the place. Um, so a land acknowledgement might be very different for you than somebody who is a immigrant or um, a settler in a place. But a land acknowledgement is something that is a step towards um, bringing our consciousness to recognize the places where we are and the indigenous roots of that place. Um, so that is something that you might consider depending on who you are and where you are. And again, I'm not gonna, um, I can't give you the right information for the place that you are. You, you know, I, there's lots of resources if you just do some Googling and stuff to find a way to be um, proper. I, I do sometimes feel like when I've heard land acknowledgements, they do f sometimes they just feel a little bit inauthentic um, and just sort of like uh, going through the motion. So I feel really welcome, the, if you, especially if you're a settler or an immigrant to a place, to be really heartfelt in your experience um, not just you know your intention for doing it is really to really acknowledge and honor the indigenous peoples and the place um, i can't tell you what a right way and a wrong way is and i think that's just something that i just really want to especially if you're new to this to to take into consideration and then also another thing that i won't really go into because that's just it really depends on where you are and who you are just being mindful if you are like a settler or a um, immigrant to a place to the land where you live um, to be mindful of cultural appropriation um, that maybe there's certain things that are kind of just the norm like a, like a really easy one to pick is like burning sage you know that's like a lot of people burn sage and I'm not judging anyone or anything that is not my place right now, but just to name that there may be, ac you know, gestures that you do or um, practices that you do that, you know, just being aware to, to make sure that you're doing it in a, in a way that is right for the place and the people. So that again is, you know, something that as the, as the facilitator, I think is something that for you to, um, to do your research, talk to people of the place, um, you know, just depending on where you are and maybe you're an indigenous to the place so that doesn't even apply to you because you're practicing your own culture. Other questions or um, anything to add to that? Oh, I guess one thing I, I just wanted to add about the anger question that uh -huh. came up. Uh -huh. um, and as a facilitator, um, you can set up just little agreements um, of conduct in the beginning. Um, so that's a way to set your container. That's a great. Um, yeah, just not to say like, 
So you can say anger is welcome, but maybe not like, but please don't shame another person in our group or, or, you know, you, yeah. you would just kind of, if you feel that anger could come up from one of your participants, which I'm wondering if maybe it's on your mind, like just speak to that um, um, as an acknowledgement. And one thing I've seen done is then you, you just have like maybe respectful speech and then you say, okay, um, does that, can everyone agree to at least be respectful to the others in the group? I raised my hand. Okay, everyone agrees. So you do like an agreement. That is excellent, Leela. I really appreciate you sharing that. And um, that is something that you could even just put in your announcement, your, inv you know, the, the, you know, what to bring, you know, what time and where, and also just maybe come up with some agreements, you know, just because we don't necessarily have a lot of time to go into a lot, but just thinking of those things ahead. And then when you get there, every, people have already seen that. And then you can just kind of like, did everyone have a chance to read those agreements and maybe um, highlighting some of the really important ones like the respectful of speech. Really great point. Thank you. Kind of preventing it, but also welcoming all feelings. Um, yeah, another thing that may or may not be appropriate depending on who and where you are is asking permission of the place before you go or just announcing and introducing yourself to the place when you arrive. That's something that you might do, you know, once everyone gets there and, and you know, you come into a circle together and then you can do whatever those um, introductions, maybe I, I liked it also just introduction of, of each other, you know, just sharing maybe your name and a word or two while you're here is a nice way to just kind of break a little bit of ice if people are strangers. Um, So just a couple other things, the act of participating in a global earth exchange to me and many other people see it as a way to see our wholeness and how we are a part of and interconnected with the places where we live. Um, the transformation that can happen is not just to the self, but to the place, to each other. I mean, I, I don't know about others of you who are on this call or who are listening, when I have done these global earth exchanges with other people, I just feel such a deep connection and just really energized being around the people and sharing in the place. Um, doesn't always happen that way. You know, there may, you know, people may walk away feeling sadness. Um, but to me, it is, it is definitely a way to open our eyes and honor the diversity of our world, to see the interconnectedness and just having that act of reciprocity to the place by offering, making that offering, and even just the offering of, of being present with it, seeing the whole ecological community and how we're all a part of it. Um, I know for me that, that something really powerful, <coughs> sorry, uh, like the turning towards, like the, the no aversion, like just, keep turning towards the wound. It's something that, um, that I really appreciate about uh, this practice and and um, breaking the habit of looking away and yeah. Yeah, yeah, very much so. I guess um, just a couple of other things about facilitating, you know, again i as i spoke to earlier you know if it is something new and you do feel a little bit of um anxiety about it starting small but also um having that in itself as a facilitator be an act of gentleness and kindness toward yourself any doubts self-doubts that come up that can just be a practice in itself of just noticing that you're having these self-doubt or oh you you know forgot to say something and just and and just letting it be letting it be what it is it's an act of self-compassion in itself and i know this is a question people have asked of what happens if you invite people and people don't show up you know you might feel disappointment you might feel self-doubt um but i will say especially if you're doing this on june 15th you're not doing it by yourself because you are doing it with a community all over the globe um, on that day. 
And you're also not by yourself because you're with this place and there's a whole living community. Even if you're not in a, if you, even if you're a place like a gravel parking lot, there is a community above and below the ground, like you are not alone. So just some things to keep in mind. If you, if you feel a little discouraged, um, you're not, um, you're not alone and you are practicing with others all around you. So as I said, it, the, we really want to encourage you, if you're going to do this, to do it on June 15th, but it can be done. Um, ideally, if you can't do it on June 15th, sometimes I've not been able to, and I may not be able to do it on June 15th this year either, because I'm supposed to be in a retreat, is um, doing it within a week. So like by the 22nd of June, because if you can get it, if you do it during that time, we'll, they'll still have time to um, share your stories because that is something i forgot to mention when you after you do your global earth exchange we really ask you to sign up um, and when you sign up you will upload your photos and your story and that'll go on our website which i will share the link and it's just really beautiful and inspiring to see all the different um, places and stories that people have done all over the world on that day or somewhere in that in that vicinity but that said if you can't do it even up to June 22nd, you know, I still encourage you to do it. Um, I've certainly done it outside of the window myself just because I've been traveling or something. So, yeah. I will share the link to sign up. And I guess the first 75 people who sign up are going to get this really beautiful handmade, hand dyed flag of the um, Radical Joy for Hard Times flag for the Global Earth Exchange. Um, but we'll share that link at the end. Now I'm seeing that sign, Leela, that it's showing the updated, the update. <laughs> um, okay, so now I'm going to share some examples of just some of the past stories and experiences people have had. You guys seeing my screen? I can't see. Okay, thumbs up. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but that for me that still there. Oh. It's, like, it's right in front of the bird. Like, I'm so it's sorry. Like, I don't see it. That's really weird. It says a free keynote update is available. Okay. Yeah, I'm seeing that same in thing okay. in search as well. Let me try. That is so weird. Not I saw it at one point and I oh here we go no thanks okay now I now I th I think I got rid of it okay sorry about that <laughs> yeah, of course I'm but I hopefully yeah I think that should fix it now I think it did because I just said no I thought I had clicked no earlier whoops okay while I'm uh trying to screen share just take a pause maybe just check in think about maybe if you have a place that you're thinking of. There we go. Got good. Okay. All clear. Thank you. <laughs> Gotta love technology. Now I've lost my ability to put it on slideshow. You're, are you like, you're not seeing it as a slideshow, right? You're seeing it as a, um, like a bunch of pan, you see all the pain, the panels. Where did my tab go? Oh, I see why Keynote is open. Okay, I don't even know why that was open. There we go. Now I'm in the right place. I was in the wrong presentation. <laughs> okay, so you guys can see my, you can see a group of people on a standing around a radical joy bird. Okay, awesome. So I, these are just, I'm just going to go through a few just to kind of give you an idea of places and the artwork that people create. Here's one being man, being a created. You can bring children to your events. So this one is one that's demonstrating a, the art that was created is not the radical joy bird, but it's beautiful nevertheless. 
Here's another one. Sometimes you got to use your imagination a little. <laughs> Somebody got inspired to clean up the beach. This is, a, I kind of go back to the beach. So, you, you know, this is a great place. This next slide is a great example of how you can use the materials on the land that's, you know, even just the rubbish. Like, I don't know if those are cigarette lighters or something that somebody used to create the beak of the bird. I think this is one that we did. Leela, I think you might, I think your feet might be in this slide. <laughs> we created our bird out of a bunch of marine debris and a coconut, looks like. And this is one that was done, this is a military base. Um, this is one Leela and I were talking about earlier. So we created our bird on the fence of a barbed wire um, military installation. Um, and it was really interesting after we did this, I realized this bird looks just like a, um, an albatross, a black-footed albatross. <laughs> so you get really creative. This is one that's it's really, this is actually a neighborhood my neighborhood, a, a really desolate hiking trail. And you can you can just barely see my, it's not a great image, but it's just, you can barely see my little offering in the front right, kind of right corner. You can see a little color, that was my bird. And then this is one, this is one that I did in Volcano, Hawaii actually. Um, I actually did this, was for the gravel that was in my friend's yard. I had never really, um, it just, I was in this yard in Volcano and I was sort of drawn to this spot where there's just all this gravel that I'm sure was imported from somewhere. And it just, I just felt this real heartbreak of this, you know, where did this gravel come from? And it was probably some massive stone part of the earth at one time. And it just, it really touched me deeply. And I never looked at gravel again the same, <laughs> which is another thing that's really beautiful about this practice. It really changes how you see the world. Um, this one, I think this is yours, Jennifer. If you wanted to say anything, well, I'll just flip through the slides and if, anything you want to add. Sure. Um, as I said, I live on um, Lake Erie in Buffalo, New York. We had this beautiful um, piece of land right on the outer harbor with, that had <clears throat> used to have uh, factories. And over time, they all uh, fell down and were removed. And then the land had started renewing itself and reinvigorating itself. And the new owners of the land decided it would be a great place for an outdoor concert amphitheater, which in Buffalo, New York, means it will get used for, you know, not that many, not even half of the year. And so all this destruction of the land again trees were removed, um, things were paved, but there are these beautiful wildflowers. So that's where I did my earth exchange last year. And uh, I used some of the construction materials and brought a little bit of blue sand with me. So there's bottles and um, sticks and cigarette butts and pipes and um, water bottles mm. and debris all around. Thank you, Jennifer. This is one year I did in my backyard. There was this beautiful, um, it's a medicinal plant called noni and somebody just hacked it and there was nothing left. There was no leaves, no nothing. And I was just really heartbroken because I'd been visiting this plant regularly and watching the fruit start to, to ripen. And so I just did this little, I don't, I'm sorry for the kind of warped image. I'm not sure why it's so warped, but I just did this little, um, offering to this noni plant that I was grief stricken, um, devastated when I saw what happened. But I also um, want to just sort of add, this is the plant today. It actually regenerated and you can still see um, at the very base of the stem where it starts to kind of branch a little, that was where it was hacked off. And now you can see this you know, massively thriving plant. And I just, when I did the, when I did my, um, global earth exchange there I was just sort of I think I did this twice because it got hacked twice and the, this is I think the second time but the first time I went back and there was like these little buds that had started to sprout and that's when I did the global earth exchange when I saw the buds and I just was just kind of blown away by the resiliency of this plant and it made me realize this is a, a plant that was brought to Hawaii from 
um, with the Polynesians when they arrived, it's called a canoe plant. And it just, I just was like, now I understand why they brought this plant because how resilient that it could spend a month on a canoe and it, you know, somebody just hacked it off and it's just still growing. Incredible inspiration to me. So I just wanted to kind of end the, um, that little sharing on that note. <laughs> um, any other um, sharings of just anyone who has done a global earth exchange want to just offer any anything more about your pra past practices? Stop share. There we go. Okay. Um, so we only have about 10 more minutes and I wanted to go into just, a uh, touch a couple other things of just take a couple minutes really to talk about a little bit about the grief, how we are, at least in my culture, a very grief averse, illiterate society, and it can be really difficult. So one of the things you might do to get people to come, it might be hard. Um, so just kind of acknowledging that. But you might start by just inviting people who might already understand, you know, then they can bring a friend or, you know, that's kind of how it was with me um, when I have had these gatherings. And just kind of wanted to name a few things that, you know, the destruction of the world around us can really lead to psychological numbing. Um, we already spoke of this fear, anger, outrage, or avoidance. You know, that's why it's so hard for us sometimes to, to witness these sites. Um, and the denial and the repression guilt that we have for the loss of our, the world as we know it. Um, and that includes humans and all life and place. And some of that grief that we have, I think it really comes out of, um, you know, our love for the world, but it, it's considered a form of disenfranchised grief. I think right now I'm seeing more and more um, articles written about ecological grief, um, these feelings that we have of despair, fear, climate grief, eco grief, eco anxiety, these are all really healthy, normal response to the destruction of the places, the species, the earth that we love. So I just want to kind of name that. And I think that's important to name if you do hold one of these with a group. There's even some new words that we have now, solastalgia. It's called the pain one feels when the place where one lives and that one loves is under assault. This new word to me called noctalgia, meaning the night grief. This is what I experience really immensely. It's coined by astronomers. Um, you know, that only now in the most remote places in the earth do we see the, the, the night sky as dark as our ancestors knew it. I think that so itself creates a real sense of separation to our, to who we are and our, um, our part in this greater universe. Um, even these dark areas, I, apparently I was reading last night, I think like they're actually getting lighter too, just because of all the pollution we have in the sky. So just really important to acknowledge that, that, you know, many of us are not taught how to grieve in the U.S., especially, I think, um, at least in my experience, there's also a focus on, you know, staying busy when you're feeling grief, staying positive. But just again, I just want to really point out that our pain for the world is normal and healthy. And it's a response to what is happening. And we re when we repress that pain, we can shut off and even deny parts of ourselves. And by being with our pain, we are opening the door to being able to experience our life as a human at its fullest. It's a very courageous act. And just the world that many of us live in, just that separation from nature itself, the way we are so living our lives, um, sort of disconnected, can also contribute to our suffering. So by going to the places that we're wounded, by being with whatever emotions we have, being curious, practicing deep listening, just give us an opportunity to discover our connections to place, to each other, and even ourselves. So the intention of a global earth exchange isn't meant to heal a place, but participating in it can bring about healing and deeper connection, which I really feel like will shift our con consciousness about who we are in the world and restore our relationship with the earth, even, in, even if it's just 
one person at a time, one global earth exchange at a time. Another one that I've heard, um, that I have a friend who does this is um, when you're doing the listening, um, you can listen for all the birds songs that are gone. So you listen to the birds that are there, but knowing that the there's actually a sonic environment that's yeah. disappearing as well. And so there's a lot of efforts to like make recordings and listen to the the sounds of of a place, a lost landscape, a soundscape, mm -hmm. soundscape, yeah, yeah. That's I mean that's a beautiful one you can do. Like you know it, us here in Hawaii, we have the native soundscape, and then we go to a forest that's with you know silent. Um, it's not meant to be silent. So honoring our pain for that, that could be mm -hmm. that in itself could be a global earth exchange. Um, I guess one other thing, well, I'll, I'm going to share this poem by Mary Oliver, because I think it really kind of sums it up really nicely. And she says, praying, it doesn't have to be the blue iris. It could be weeds in a vacant lot or a few small stones. Just pay attention, then patch a few words together and don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but the doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. So I really feel like this poem sums up what a global earth exchange can be. Elizabeth, I, I don't know if you see that Liz has her hand up. Please, Liz, please, please. Um, I don't see, so thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I wanted to have an idea before we ran out of thought or question before we ran out of time. On the question of um, personal safety mm -hmm. or emotional safety um, and the question of anger came up. Um, what, it, what about passersby who um, get triggered um, by you know, like there's a, especially if there's a group of people in a particular spot, um, they start getting dysregulated, anger, or other, um, you know, behaviors or emotions, um, you know, can, can connected to, um, like what is this group of people doing here? What are they doing? Um, and if you start explaining, I mean, that could in you don't know what's going on with this person's history of right. trauma, whatever. Um, can you speak to? Um, if that's happened in past exchanges, um, strategies for anticipating, mitigating those kinds of encounters? I have never heard of that happening. Um, and I would just say, I would just treat it as any other situation where you're feeling unsafe about a stranger around you. You know, if you're feeling unsafe, calling the, you know, calling the police. Um, I don't, you know, I don't anticipate that it would be something that's, you know, it's certainly possible that it could happen. And it's really important to think about but I have never heard of it happening in a global earth exchange. Um, and that might even speak a little bit to where you select your site. You know, if you're, if you're choosing a site that maybe you have a little um, hesitation of like who could sh potentially show up, maybe that, that maybe listening to that information that your body is giving you, and maybe, maybe that's not the right place. If you're feeling like hmm, there could be some people milling around where I might not feel safe. So there's nothing that, there's no way we can like avoid you know, plan ahead for every situation, you know, it's just not possible, right? Because things just happen. But I would just, um, you know, that's kind of what comes to my mind. Um, you know, I haven't really ever thought about that, because I haven't really been in a place where I would anticipate that happening. But I, that's kind of the first thing I would say is, if you have any hesitation, possibly choosing another site, or doing it in a, you know, from a different kind of how Leela was speaking of, could you do it like, you know, it's a toxic waste dump. We don't want to stand next to it, but could we do it from, you know, several hundred feet away or whatever? So that's kind of, you know, if anyone else here, you know, I'm, I'm not the only, <laughs> um, I am not an expert on um, that, but I just feel like you would just handle it in any other situation where you were with a friend, group of friends or something, and you started to feel unsafe. If other people have good ideas, I'm sure there's other, I, other thoughts. I guess I'm I'm just wondering if Liz, if you're speaking about not 
a dangerous place per se, but maybe um, people who don't share the same views about yeah. honoring the earth. Oh, that's part of it. Um, they somehow make that connection between people who are caring about this place and seeing it as wounded and you know, wanting to do this practice. Um, I mean, uh, very could be triggered with, um, for example, say somebody who's very right wing, I'm triggered with, oh, this person must be associated with very left wing politics, therefore evil, therefore, yeah. you know, must react. And some, you know, the um, distortions that can happen, people get dysregulated. Um, this is in the zeitgeist. So particularly, I'm thinking I live in a very red state, mm -hmm. um, and I know environmentalists is tantamount to demon amongst some of my neighbors. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm coming from. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a valid concern and something to think about. And maybe in that situation, you would feel more comfortable doing something in your yard. You know, if you're if th that's why I feel like, you know, listening to those voices in your head, you're anticipating there could be some challenges that maybe that is um, not the right place to go. Yeah. Looks like do we have another question? OK, um, I'm I'm going to go ahead and just wrap things up really quickly because I don't want to go over I'm probably going to go over a couple minutes but I want to um, just talk a little bit take take a moment to just talk about um, reincorporation so if you after you do this global earth exchange you might take some time to just journal or talk to friends about your experience so kind of just sort of processing what ex what you experienced after the fact um, and maybe you want to even just continue visiting the place and coming back um, as a regular practice. So just something that you can do. And with that, unless there are other questions, which I can't see, so please let me know if there are. I'm gonna just end on this um, little video that I hopefully can share. I'm gonna share my screen again. That is just a really beautiful little kind of um, showcase of prior global earth exchanges Where is it? here we go can you guys see that good okay strong ties these are the things that keep me here deep roots and strong ties holding the ground beneath my heart I'm bound to this land like a tree from the mountainside Water runs through the streams like blood running through my veins. This homeland is our land. The ground beneath our hearts. After all, have we found no matter the cause we will never surrender the ground beneath our hearts are the things that hold me here deep roots and strong ties holding the ground beneath my heart hold on to the ground beneath your heart hold on to the ground beneath our